Just two years before his death in 1984, Dr. Francis Schaeffer delivered this powerful critique of modern American culture at Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. His still relevant message exposes the source of America's moral disarray and calls on Christians to speak and act against all the horrors and stupidity of the present moment, as he described it. Dr. Francis Schaeffer was one of the most influential Christian thinkers of the 20th century. He influenced an entire generation through his 22 books and his Labrie Fellowship in Switzerland and elsewhere. Dr. Schaeffer was a firm defender of the Bible as God's absolute truth and of the sacred worth of every human life. He is widely acknowledged as one of the intellectual and spiritual giants of the last century. The late Dr. Francis Schaeffer. Christians, in the last 80 years or so, have only been seeing things as bits and pieces. Instead of seeing things which have gradu gradually begun to trouble Christians and others also of goodwill, such as over permissiveness, pornography, the problem of the public schools, the breakdown of the family, abortion, infanticide, the killing of newborn babies, increased emphasis upon the euthanasia of the old, many, many other things. They have seen these as isolated bits and pieces instead of understanding that they, they are the only, they are the natural outcome of a change from a Christian worldview to a humanistic one. All these things and many more are only the results. We may be troubled with the individual thing, but in reality, we are missing the whole thing if we do not see each of these things and many more as only symptoms of the deeper problem. And that is a change in our society, a change in our country, a change in the Western world, from a Judeo-Christian consensus to a humanistic one. That is, instead of the final reality that exists, being the infinite creator God, instead of that which is the basis of all reality, being such a creator God, now, largely, all else is seen as only material or energy which has existed forever in some form, shaped into its present complex form only by pure chance. And I want to say to you, those of you who are Christians, or even if you're not a Christian and you're troubled about the direction that our society is going in, that we must not concentrate merely on the bits and pieces, but we must understand that all these dilemmas come on the basis of moving from the Judeo-Christian worldview that the final reality is an infinite personal creator God over into this other reality, which let me re again speak of what it is, and that is the final reality is only energy, or material in some mixture of form which has existed forever and which has taken its present shape by ch pure chance. The word humanism should be carefully defined. We should not just use it as a flag, as what I, the younger people might call a buzzword. We must understand what we're talking about when we use the word humanism. Humanism means that man is the measure of all things. Man is the measure of all things. If this other final reality of material or energy, shaped by pure chance, is the final reality, it gives no meaning to life. It gives no value system. It gives no basis for law. And therefore, in this case, Man must be the measure of all things. 
So humanism, properly defined, in contrast to, let's say, the humanities or humanitarianism, which is something entirely different, and which Christians should be in favor of both of these others. Humanism, being the measure of all things, comes naturally, mathematically, inevitably, certainly, if indeed the final reality is silent about these values, man must generate them from himself. So humanism is the absolute certain result if we choose this other final reality and say that is what it is. You must realize that when we speak of man being the measure of all things under the humanist label, the first thing is that man has only knowledge from himself, that he being finite, limited, uh, very faulty in his observation in many things, yet nevertheless has no possible source of knowledge except what man beginning from himself can find out by his own observation. Specifically, in this view, there is no place for any knowledge from God. But it is not only that man must start from himself in the area of knowledge and learning, but any value system must come arbitrarily from man himself uh, by arbitrary choice. And more frightening still, in our country, at our own moment of history, is the fact that any basis of law then becomes arbitrary. Merely certain people making decisions as to what is for the good of society at the given moment. Now this is the real re reason for the breakdown in morals in our country. It's the real reason for the breakdown in values in our country. And it is the reason that our Supreme Court now functions so thoroughly upon the fact of arbitrary law. They have no basis for law that is fixed. Therefore, like the young person who decides to leave, live hedonistically upon their own chosen arbitrary values, society is now doing the same thing legally. A certain few people come together and decide what they arbitrarily believe is for the good of society at the given moment, at the given moment, and that becomes law. The worldview that the final reality is only material or energy shaped by pure chance, inevitably, that's the next word I would bring to you, inevitably, mathematically, with mathematical certainty, brings forth all these other results, which are in our country and in our society, which has led to the breakdown in the country, in society, and which are its present sorrows. So if you hold this other worldview, you must realize that it is inevitable that we will come to the very sorrows of relativity and all these other things uh, that, are the, that are so represented in our country at this moment of history. It should be noticed that this new dominant worldview is the view is a view which is exactly opposite from that of the founding fathers who founded this country. Now not all the founding fathers of this country were individually, personally Christians. That certainly is true. But nevertheless, they founded the country on the base that there is a God who is the creator now I come to the next central phrase. Who is the creator who gave the inalienable rights? We must understand something very thoroughly. If society, if the state gives the rights, it can take them away. They're not inalienable. If the state gives the rights, they can change them and manipulate them. But this was not the view of the founding fathers of this country. They believed, though not all of them were individual Christians, that there was a creator, and that this creator gave the inalienable rights. This upon which our country was founded, and which has given us the freedoms which we still have, even the freedoms which are being used now to destroy the freedoms. The reason that these freedoms were there is because they believed there was somebody who gave the inalienable rights 
which indeed, therefore, limited the power of the state and the government specifically by these inalienable rights. But if we have the view that the final reality is material or energy, which has existed forever in some form, we must understand this view never, never, never would have given the rights which we now know and which unhappily I say to you, those of you who are Christians, too often you take all too all as much for granted. You forget that the freedoms we have had in Northern Europe after the Reformation in the United States is an extended extension of that as would be out of Australia or Canada or New Zealand and so on. You forget that the freedoms which we have are absolutely unique in the world. Occasionally, some of you have gone to university and have been taught that these freedoms are rooted in the Greek city-states. That is not true. All you have to do is read Plato's Republic and you understand that the Greek city-states never had any concept of the freedoms that we have. Go back into history. The freedoms which we have, the form freedom, balance of government, all these things, they are unique in history. And they're also unique in the world at this day. A fairly recent poll of the 150-some countries that now constitute the world shows that only about 25%, only 25 of these countries have any value, have any freedoms at all. What we have and take so poorly for granted is unique. It was brought forth by a specific worldview. And that specific worldview was the Judeo-Christian worldview and especially as it was refined in the Reformation, putting the authority indeed at a central point, not in the church and the state and the word of God, but rather the word of God alone. All the benefits which we know, I would repeat, which we have taken so easily and so much for granted are unique. They have been founded on this certain worldview that there is a creator there to give the inalienable rights. And this other view over here, which has become increasingly dominant, of the material energy final worldview, shaped by pure chance, never would have, could not, has no basis of values in order to give such a balance of freedom that we have known so easily and which we unhappily, if we're not careful, take so for granted. We're now losing those freedoms. And we can expect to continue to lose them if this other worldview continues to take increased force and power in our country. We can be sure of this. I would say it again, inevitably, mathematically, all these things will come forth. There's no possible way to heal the relativistic thinking of our own day if indeed all there is is a universe out there that is silent about any values. None whatsoever. It is not possible. It is a loss of values and there's a loss of freedom which we may be sure will continually grow. A good illustration is in the public schools. This view is taught in our public schools exclusively by law. There's no other view that can be taught. I'll mention it a bit later. But by law, there is no other view that can be taught. By law, in the public schools of the United States of America in 1982, legally there is only one view of reality that can be taught. And that is that the final reality is only material energy shaped by pure chance. It is the same with the television programs. Public television gives us many things that many of us like culturally, but is also completely committed to a propaganda position that the last reality is only material or energy shaped by pure chance. Clark's civilization, Bernowski, the Son of Man, Carl Sagan, Cosmos, they all say it. The new one that's on says it with great dogmatism. There is only one final view of reality that's possible. 
And that is the final reality is material or energy shaped by pure chaff. There's about us on every side. And especially the government and especially the courts have become the vehicle to force this anti-God view on the total population. That's exactly where we are. The abortion ruling is a very clear one. The abortion ruling, of course, is also a natural result of this other worldview, because with this other worldview, human life, your individual life, has no intrinsic value. You are a wart upon the face of an absolutely impersonal universe. Your aspirations have no fulfillment in the what isness of what is. Your aspirations damn you. And many of the young people who come to us understand this very well because their aspirations of humanists have no fulfillment if indeed the final reality is only material or energy shaped by pure chance. The universe cannot fulfill anything that you say when you say it is beautiful. I love. It is right. It is wrong. These words are meaningless words against the backdrop of this other this other world view. So what we find is the abortion case should not have been a surprise because it boiled up out of, and quite naturally, I would use the word again, mathematically, this other world view. In this case, human life has no distinct value whatsoever, and we find this the Supreme Court in one ruling overthrew the abortion laws of all 50 states. And they made this form of killing human life, because that's what it is, the law declared that this form of killing human life was to be accepted. And for many people, because they had no set ethic, when the Supreme Court said that it was legal, for many people in the intervening years it has become ethical. The courts of this country have forced this view and its results on the total population. What we find that as the courts have done this, without any longer that which the founding fathers comprehended of law, a man like Blackstone with his commentaries understood, the other the lawgivers of this country in the beginning, and that is that there is a law of God upon which gives foundation. When the courts of this country cut themselves loose from the law of God, it becomes quite natural then that they should all, they would also cut themselves loose from a strict constructionism concerning the Constitution. Everything is relative. So as you cut yourself loose from the law of God, in any concept whatsoever, you also soon are cutting yourself loose from a strict constructionism, and each ruling is to be seen as an arbor arbitrary choice uh, by a group of people as to what they may honestly think is for the sociological good of the community, of the country, for the given moment. Now along with that is the fact that the courts are increasingly making law, and thus we find that the legislature's powers are increasingly diminished in relationship to the power of the courts. Now the pro-abortion people have been very wise about this in the last, say, 10 years, and Christians very silly. And I wonder sometimes where we've been. Because the pro-abortion people have used the courts for their end rather than the legislatures because the courts are not subject to the people's thinking nor their will either by election nor by a re-election. Consequently, the courts have been the vehicle that has been used to bring this whole view and to force it on our total population. It has not been largely the legislatures. It has been, the, rather, the courts. The result is a relativistic value system, a lack of any final meaning to life. A lack of any final meaning to life, that's first. Why does human life have any value at all? if that is all the reality is. It's not only you're going to die individually, but the whole human race is going to die. Someday, and it may not take the fall of the atom bombs, 
But someday the world will grow too hot, too cold, that's what we're told, on this other final reality. And someday all you people not only will be individually dead, but the whole conscious life on this world will be dead. And nobody will see the birds fly. And there's no meaning to life. And you know I don't speak academically, shut off in a scholastic cubic as it is. I have lots of young people and older ones come to us and from the end of the earth. And as they come to us, this really, they have gone to the end of this logically and they're not living in a romantic setting. They realize what the situation is. They can't find any meaning to life. It's the meaning of the black poetry. It's the meaning of the black plays. It's the meaning of all this. It's the meaning of the words of punk rock. And I must say that on the basis of what they're being taught in school, that the final reality is only this material thing, they're not wrong. They're right. They're not wrong. They're right. On this other basis, there is no meaning to life. And not only there is no meaning to life, but there is no value system that is fixed. And we find uh, that the law is based then only on a relativistic basis and that law becomes purely arbitrary. And this is brought to bear specifically and perhaps most clearly in the public schools, I'll come to that now, in this country, in the courts of this country, saying that it's absolutely illegal. It's absolutely illegal uh, from the lowest grades up through university for the schools, the public schools of this country, to teach any other worldview except this worldview of final material or energy. Now this is done no matter what the parents may wish. This is done regardless of what those who pay the taxes for their schools may wish. I'm giving an illustration as well as making a point. The way the courts force their view and this view of the false view of reality on the total population, no matter what the total population wants. We find that in the January 18th, just recently, Time magazine, there was an article that said that there was a poll uh, that pointed out that about 76% of the people in this country thought it would be a good idea to have both creation and evolution taught in the public schools. I don't know if the poll was accurate, but assuming that the poll is accurate, what does it mean? It means that your public schools are told by the courts that they cannot teach this even though 76% of the people in the United States want it taught. I'll give you a word. It's tyranny. There is no other word that fits at such a point. And at the same time, we find the medical profession has radically changed. Dr. Koop, in our seminars for whatever happened, the human race often said that when I, speaking himself, when I graduated from medical school, the idea was, how can I save this life? But for a great number of the medical students now, it's not how can I save this life, but should I save this life? Believe me, it's everywhere. It isn't just abortion, it's a fantasize. It's allowing the babies to starve to death after they're born if they do not come up to some doctor's concept of a quality of life worth living. And I just say in passing and never forget it. It takes about 15 days often for these babies to starve to death. And I'd say something else that we haven't stressed enough. In abortion itself, there is no abortion method that is not painful to the child just as painful that month before birth as the baby you see in one of these cribs down here at I pass a month after the birth. Just as painful. So what we find, what we find then is that the medical profession has largely changed. Not all doctors. I'm sure there are doctors here in the audience who feel very, very differently who feel indeed that human life is important and you wouldn't take it easily, wantonly. But in general, we must say, and all you have to do is look at the TV programs, all you have to do is to hear about the increased talk about the euthanasia, allowing the mongoloid child, the child with the Down syndrome, to starve to death if it's born this way. Increasingly, we find on every side the medical profession has changed its views. The view now is, is this life? 
We're saving. I look at you. You're an older congregation than I'm usually used to speaking to. You better, you better think. Because this means you. It does not stop with abortion in the found side. It stops with the question, what about the old person? Is he worth hanging on to? Is he worth hanging on to? Should we, as they're doing in England in this awful, awful organization, exit, teach older people to commit suicide? Should we help them get rid of them because they're an economic burden? A nuisance. I want to tell you, once you begin chipping away in the medical profession at the intrinsic value of human life founded upon the Judeo-Christian concept that man is unique because he is made in the image of God and his value is not because he's well, strong, a consumer, a sex object, or any other thing. His value is intrinsic because he is unique in the universe as made in the image of God. That is where whatever co compassion this country has, and certainly it's far from perfect and it's never been perfect, nor out of the Reformation has there been a golden age, but whatever compassion there's ever been, it's rooted in the fact that our culture knows that man is unique as made in the image of God. Take it away, and I just say gently, the stopper is out of the bathtub for all human life. The January 11 Newsweek has an article about the baby in the womb. The first five or six pages are marvelous. If you haven't seen that, you should dig it, ask, see if you can get that issue. It's January 11th, and about the first five or six pages shows conclusively what every biologist has known all along, and that is human life begins at conception. There is no other time for human life to begin except at conception. Monkey life begins a conception. Donkey life begins a conception. And human life begins a conception. Biologically, there's no discussion. Never should have been. From a scientific viewpoint, I'm not speaking of religious, no. And this five, six pages, very carefully, goes into the fact that human life begins a conception. But the, you flip the page, and there's a big black headline, but is it a person? But is it a person? And I'll read the last sentence. But, or no, the problem is not determining when actual human life begins. The five pages before that shown that. But when the value of that life begins to outweigh other considerations, such as the health or even the happiness of the mother. I'm just talking about the health of the mother. It's a propaganda line. Or even the happiness of the mother. Listen, spell that out. It means that the mother, for her own hedonistic happiness, selfish happiness, can take human life by her choice, by law. Do you understand what I've said? By law, on the basis of her individual choice of what makes her happy, she can take what has been declared to be in the first five pages to be with, without any question, human life. In other words, they acknowledge the human life is there, but it's an open question of whether it is not right to kill that human life if it makes the mother unhappily, and basically that is no different than Stalin male or Hitler killing who he killed for what he conceived to be the good of society. There is absolutely no line between the two states. No absolute line whatsoever. It one follows along. Once it is from the other. Once it is acknowledged that it is human life that is involved and as I've said this issue in Newsweek shows conclusively that it is once it is acknowledged that it is human life that is involved, the acceptance of the death of human life in baby.